my name is Kirsten Chomi, and I am the president of our local League of Women Voters of Brooklyn Park, Osseo, Maple Grove, and we also take care of Brooklyn Center. Um, and we welcome you here tonight to help us celebrate 100 years of the League of Women Voters and the white right to vote. And uh, for those who may have forgotten, the League of Women Voters is a volunteer organization that is nonpartisan and it is organized at the local, state, and national levels. Um, our local league here is 57 years old, I believe, if I have that correct. So we've been here protecting the right to vote and making sure we're getting everybody registered so that they can have a say in who helps shape our cities and the state of Minnesota. Um, we have a traveling exhibit, if some of you have gotten a chance to see it. It's been going around uh, the state of Minnesota already, and for the next two weeks it'll be here at Maple Grove until February 6th, and then we're packing it up and we're bringing it over to Hennepin County Library in Brooklyn Park, right off of Zane and uh, 85th. Whereas the League of Women Voters celebrates its 100th anniversary, and whereas the League of Women Voters was founded for the purpose of completing full enfranchisement of women and increasing the effectiveness of women's voices in further furthering better government, and whereas the League of Women Voters of Minnesota was founded in 1919, a little ahead of everybody else, thank you, <laughs> after state ratification of the 19th Amendment, and the League of Women Voters of the United States was founded in 1920 after the 19th Amendment was ratified by our country, and whereas we recognize and celebrate a century of activism by the League of Women Voters, and whereas we recall our nation's history through a lens of diversity, equity, inclusion, acknowledging the hard truth that is in our origins, the League of Women Voters was late in joining to help protect all voters at the polls. And whereas we remind our citizens that the democracy depends on their participation through educating themselves on the issues and through voting. And whereas the League of Women Voters of Brooklyn Park, Osseo, Maple Grove has served our community with dedication and integrity for oops, 55 years with their education on public policy and holding nonpartisan voter registration drives and hosting informative candidate forums, of which I've been a moderator many times, <laughs> for local, municipal, school board, and county elections. And now, therefore, it be resolved that I, not me, Mark Stephenson, mayor, do hereby proclaim that January 23rd, 2020, as League of Women Voters Centennial Day and congratulate the League of Women Voters of Brooklyn Park, Osseo, Maple Grove on the League of Women Voters 100th anniversary. We thank Maple Grove for their recognition. All right, uh, we also, I just wanted to uh, give a little wave to, we have a representative, Kristen Robbins, representing Maple Grove for 34A. She stopped in this evening, and she's gonna be donating a book to the library. <laughs> she shoved it in her bag. That's okay. So, as, as members of the legislature, all women legislators were given this book, Grace Books to Washington, celebrating the 100th anniversary of women's suffrage. And it's been in my office, which has been fun, but I don't get a lot of kids to come over there, so I'm going to donate it to the library, and hopefully a lot of kids will get to enjoy it. But I'm just delighted to see you all here. It's such a great turnout and a great reason to celebrate the League of Women Voters. I've been the beneficiary of their forums, which has been fantastic, and all the hard work that you do registering voters and getting the word out, educating people, really, it's so important. And so I, I just encourage you to keep up the great work, and I look forward to working with you along the way. Thank you. And now I have uh, Emma Youngquist, Director of Advocacy, representing uh, the Dean Phillips staff, who has a letter for us as well. Good evening, everyone. Um, as was mentioned, I'm Emma Youngquist. I'm the Director of Constituent Advocacy for Congressman Phillips in his uh, Minnetonka office. So I have a letter for you from him. Dear friends, I wish to extend my heartfelt greetings to you all as you celebrate the 100th anniversary of women's suffrage and the League of Women Voters by hosting the exhibit, A Century of Civic Engagement. Thank you for the kind invitation to join you this evening and for your steadfast commitment to empowering voters and defending democracy. I'm honored to play a small part in your celebration even though I'm unable to join you in person. My mother, Dee Dee, is a tireless voice for equality from whom I draw inspiration and strength. I remember my mother, 
who is an entrepreneur, community volunteer, and activist, wearing a green ERA Now pin 50 years ago. As a member of Congress, I honor her every day as an advocate for women's health, economic security, economic freedom, and equal rights. In February, I joined my sisters in Congress in a sea of suffragist white at the State of the Union Address. As the only male member of Congress to wear a white jacket, it was my privilege to honor the extraordinary women of the 116th Congress, my mother, and the suffragists whose tireless work afforded my great-grandmothers, Sarah Johnson and Rose Phillips, the right to vote in 1920. The League of Women Voters plays an important role in this community. You encourage education and advocacy with the goal of increasing civic engagement, and I'm grateful. I promise to continue to be a partner in your work to defend our democracy. In solidarity, Dean Phillips. Thank you. I would like to uh, introduce Sue Hain, who has been our, she's an associate librarian here, and she's been a part of our partnership with the traveling exhibit. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Sue. I'm one of the librarians here. I want to welcome all of you on behalf of Hennepin County Library. Comment cards and information about this program are available at the side of the room. And now we're very happy to have you here for this portion of the program, 100 Years of Voting Rights with activist and author Dr. Josie R. Johnson. And we're happy to have Dr. Johnson, who will speak about her experiences spanning over 50 years of work with the League on Civil and Voting Rights and her new book, Hope in the Struggle, a memoir. Without further delay, please join me in welcoming Josie Johnson. She's trying to test the volume, and so let me know if we're doing all right. Good evening, everyone. I am delighted to be here and to realize that I have probably been a member of the League almost as long as the League has been a League. I joined the League of Women Voters back in 1956, and I've had the great fortune to be engaged in it for a very long time. So I was able to serve on the Minneapolis board of the League and then the state and then first African American to serve on the national board. So my life in the League is long and deep and I have a great deal of respect for what we've tried to do all of these years and to know that we still have lots to do and I remember the work of people like Frederick Douglass, African-American activists of way back in the early 1900s who walked with the League of Women Voters in 1920 when we were marching towards women's rights. It's interesting, however, when you know a little bit more about that, we still have work to do. The League had a hard time accepting non-white members and to be engaged in the kind of work that we were engaged in at that time. Convincing people that voting rights was something we could achieve and we could do it for all people. I moved to Minnesota. My husband was transferred. We came here after he completed his work in the military and our oldest child was two and the middle one and the baby. So the baby was born here in Minnesota. And I've been engaged in this work of the League, I almost say all my life. Grew up in a family of active people. My father graduated from college in 1926 and my mother in 1929. When my father graduated from a historical black college in Texas, 
there weren't any jobs that he could uh, get. He wanted to be a lawyer and that was impossible. There were no graduate programs for African American people then. When we moved here in 1956, I was our state laws, policies, procedures, and to become engaged in the work of our state. And I was able to do that through the League of Women Voters. So the League, way back then, older than many of you sitting in this room here in Minnesota, I was able, my friends, to be engaged in understanding, learning how we function as a state and as a government. My membership in the League began, as I said, in 1956. I'm still a member. I'm almost as old as the League but I am uh, not as active now as I once was, but it is an important part of my life and an important instrument that assisted me in learning about government and policy and how to utilize what you learn, and that was the League. I was um, very active with our Minneapolis, uh, League of Women Voters organization. Some of my best friends were a part of that organization. And being on the city-wide board of the League in Minneapolis, and then moving on to the state organization. Learning how to utilize what the intent of the policies of our government and the role of citizens. So my engagement had been very deep in the function of the League and learning how citizens can continue the thrust that women had in that early day of really just trying to be citizens and engaged in the policies of our society. So serving on the Minneapolis board was a very exciting, interesting, sometimes painful period because the whole idea of complete freedom and engaging all of your citizens is still sometimes difficult for some. And it was a difficult experience initially for me because it required conversation, understanding, patience, talking. And sometimes we don't really like to engage in conversation and talk with people, and to be honest, direct, and yet loving and kind, and being what we as women and as politically active women can do. So it took a while for many to fully appreciate the fact that the League could be as broad and as open as we're still trying to be. I then went to the state level of the League and there the interest is even broader and more engaging, harder work, more thought process, and more engagement on a continuing basis rather than just attending our uh, board, our uh, unit meetings, you had to be more engaged than that. Am I right, leaguers? Yeah. yeah. So the
the uh, state organization uh, c helped further develop your knowledge and ways of being commit committed and then serving on the national board and serving with women who had a deep commitment to justice, to equality, to understanding the Constitution and what it meant, how to utilize what the intent. That is a struggle that I think we're still facing as an organization and as a citizen trying to understand what the Constitution really means and how to implement its meaning. And I think the League helps us stay focused on that. And the issues become more <coughs> and more complex which means that the need to truly, truly listen to each other, to assess where we are locally, statewide, and nationally. I am always hopeful that the intent of those women of 1920 and beyond stay a part of who we are because they were pretty determined. But my friends, there is a need to open up. And I can remember in our Minneapolis chapter of the League of Women Voters, we tried everything we could think about of ways of engaging all women, African American, Native American, Asian, Spanish speaking, all women. And that becomes a real challenge for the League. It's not a custom to necessarily having to deal really deal with the understanding of what our Constitution has tried to teach us. I can remember so many times when the effort to try to engage all sectors of our community, the League would then organize units in different parts of the city, different hours of the day, and tried to create subject matter that had a broad interest, not only for its members' activity, but to try to fulfill the mission and goal of League of Women Voters. So the word League, adding to that women and voters, has a very significant responsibility, probably more now, probably more now than we fully appreciate because the period now of understanding the Constitution, appreciating the effort to truly talk about a society, a civilization, a c community that is engaged in teaching and teaching from a non-political, non-partisan, but very, a non-political, what am I saying, a non-partisan but really understanding the politics. And the politics has changed so much in my lifetime, and I know it has for many of you. And what I'm 
begging you tonight is to recall the intent of the League of Women Voters and to really be engaged in opening dialogue, knowing our society, appreciating the various efforts that have been made over the hundred years. Can you imagine what has developed in the last hundred years? Not only of appreciating the fact that politics has many images and it has many directions and it's our responsibility as a knowledgeable part of our society to maintain the open conversations, to accept differences in thoughts and politics and methods of reaching our goal and we must do it deliberately. I think we get kind of accustomed to doing things in a particular way as a people. That's kind of how we function daily. You get used to things. And if, if, if some of us are not there, to just add another perspective or to try to be engaged in conversation that may appear to some to not be relevant to what's going on in the society. We must teach ourselves and others how to be open. The role of the League has always been very important to me because of the philosophy of the League. When I moved to Minnesota in 56 with children and activity in the community, understanding how we continue a democracy and how we understand what needs to be done in spite of many of the obstacles that we face regularly. So for me, my friends, the League is an important entity in the structure of our government. When I think about all of the things that are yet to be done, when I think about women maintaining that kind of commitment to our sense of right and wrong and knowledge of our government, its constitution, what it means, how it can be better. It requires us to do that. That's our mission, to require our government and our policies to be the best, most fair, equitable that it can be. So it's important in my judgment that we continue to believe that we have a right and we have the knowledge, the vocabulary, and the commitment to justice, to equality, to reach out to the people we don't have in our family, and to try to be as active and committed on a continuous basis. Society has a, you know, sort of a habit, as you know, of um, being excited for a few minutes about many things. 
and then we move on or we take up our old behavior. The League of Women Voters mission today is more than it was in 1920. She has a responsibility to help interpret what is going on in our society and how do we hold on to the Constitution, to the policies, and to the equality. And the League had a lot to learn about equal opportunity. We're still having to learn, right, about how to be um, as open and as receiving and as informed about current conditions as we can be and design policies that we can work and support and bring to our children the intent of freedom, justice, and equality. When I began this book, and thank you for displaying it and having a little bit of information about it, I'm very grateful to you. When I began this, it was the result of a lot of my young friends, young millennials, I guess they call that generation, asking me, how can you stay involved in the struggle and stay committed? And I thought after a while, even though that question had been put to me many times, I thought, I'm getting old. I may not be here to talk to my great-grands. I now have three great-grandchildren, age seven today, to two. And I kept thinking, I may not be able to talk to them. They, I may not be here to talk to them or to be engaged with them in what's going on in their life and how you do stay in the struggle and how you continue to have hope and carry on the pattern of your ancestors. Because when I think of what my ancestors went through, I am so impressed with their commitment and with their passing on to me and other generations what it means to struggle and to believe that you can make a difference. So when my young people asked me on a continuous basis about writing, um, many of you who write realize that's not an easy task. And for me, it was not an easy task. And what I tried to do was to figure out, as an old person who had been involved, fortunately, in many things in the state of Minnesota. I came at a time when I could indeed be involved. And so there were many ways to be involved in Minnesota. There were many needs that our people had, from fair housing to equal education opportunity to job opportunities to the whole need of appreciating who we are as a people. So yet, I was lucky and fortunate to come at a time 
when there were many things that we could collectively do. So I had a chance to be involved in many. So trying to decide what to share with my young people of how do you stay in the struggle, how do you get in the struggle, and how do you stay there and feel um, productive was difficult. But I attempted to share in this book a bit of my own upbringing to share with the people who read my book about my family, the environment I grew up in. And I am constantly grateful for the experience and exposure I had with parents who loved us, who cared, and I had two brothers, who cared about us, didn't sit and lecture us. They modeled the behavior that they wanted us to follow. They knew how to demonstrate in their love for us and their community and the work they did that it became a part of what we did and how we felt the responsibility of our community. I can remember so many times when we as a family, we always tried to eat together. And there were many nights when I would say to my brother and I, brothers and I would say to my mother, where is dad? He was always late. And she would help us understand that dad was at a meeting. He was involved in creating the NAACP in Houston and the Urban League in Houston, Texas, and being involved in the YMCA and in his church, and in all of these things that kept us involved and made him late on occasion for dinner. But it was, it was an environment that I feel forever grateful because both parents not only loved us, they loved all of our, all of the children. They were committed to the children of our community. And they modeled this. As I said, my dad was very active in everything that pointed in the direction of quality of living and loving and teaching. My mother was a social worker and an educator. And she taught, I think I share that with one of the stories here. She was a teacher and I used to go with her when my mother would go to white rich ladies' homes to teach them to read. And I could sit there. We always had to go in the back door, up the back stairs, sit in the kitchen or wherever these women felt comfortable in exposing what they did not know, and being taught by a black woman. So I learned early this whole art of sharing what you know and doing it with love for your human person. And I never felt that my parents tried to teach us to be inferior in any way. 
neither my family nor the people with whom we associated. In my community, growing up, there were all kinds of people, professional, well-informed, and not so well-informed. Many of our people who could not find a job and who found themselves in, on many occasions, having to kind of sit around. And they would urge my brothers and me to work hard, to be the best you can be, and to make a contribution to our society. And that's what we all tried to do. When I think about the selection of the stories that I shared with you in this book, they were examples of being engaged with policymakers, and where do you get that? But with the League of Women Voters, right? You learn how to do the research that you need to do. You learn how to interact with other human beings. And you learn what you need to know and how to communicate what you know. So growing up, trying to identify for my young people who kept asking, why do you stay engaged? Why do you continue the struggle? And why do you have hope? And what I realized as I tried to select a few examples of my experience, what I tried to model and demonstrate is the need to be committed to your community, to your history, to your ancestors and to be constructively engaged the best you can. To use the strategies that the League used in understanding, knowing policy, knowing how to get things done, understanding the political structure of our society, and then exercising that with all the energy and time that you have. So I was able to identify a few examples of the efforts that we were working on and the methodology for getting it done. So I hope when you have a chance to read, and I hope you will, and I thank you for displaying it, that you will join me in teaching our children justice, fairness, equality, and opportunity. My friends, we need you to be vigilant, observant, committed to the mission that we know was a part of the women's movement and where we are in a very delicate, careful place now. I beg you, think, remember what we have been trying to do in getting voices heard and experiences shared. Our civilization is probably facing 
some of the same things that we faced forever. And I'm begging you to be engaged in that. To be adults for our children. To help our children, all children, be the best they can be. You are the people who can do that. So the stories I shared in my book were stories that our young people could relate to, and they have indeed. I've had the joy of having conversation with many about different aspects of what justice and freedom means. Take time, my community, to listen to our children. Take time to tell them some of the stories they need to know. Be open. Try not to fall into this or that category, but to know that you represent the history, not only of our past, but you're developing the history of the future. And it's our children who need to see you, to hear you, to talk with you, to be open. One of the things my friend, Martha Arredondo, who took the, the great, great risk, risk of driving, driving me <laughs> in all of this weather, <laughs> But what we noticed when we walked into this library, the number of little children walking around, selecting books. And I've seen that in black communities as well as non-black communities. Children are interested. We are the historians. We have lots to tell them and to prepare them. They are moving into a period that I think is a great challenge to them. Many of you may remember the challenges as well. But our children need to know that there is the possibility of freedom, justice, opportunity, and fairness, because so many of them don't see that. And so many of our adults are so busy with so much, they don't notice the children who don't have what we're all wishing to give to our children. What I have found in just trying to understand and share is this whole idea of what do we mean by hope? We hear that word, but what do we mean by it? What does it mean to you? What is hope? Where does it come from? What are the struggles of just getting around every day, trying to be trying to find a parking space, <laughs> trying to do the routine, common things that we have to do as human beings. How do we share that? How do we take the time to hear what the young people, and many of you are young people in this room, what is it you want to talk about? to examine, to explore. Because we're in a different period than my 89 years. It's a different world. Different 
and yet the same. But different in ways that people have learned how to pretend. You know, they used to say that about us here in Minnesota, right? Minnesota nice. We really don't talk about things that are troubling <laughs> to other people. It is time for us to talk about things that are troubling because we are in great trouble in our society. I never thought I'd live long enough to see a system that is so clearly divided and that people can, can become so divided. It's a disappointment knowing the struggle of my ancestors who believed in spite of all that we went through and my ancestors went through in slavery and slave masters convincing themselves that they were doing the right thing, beating my ancestors, abusing them, denying them education and family and jobs. And then when people like the League and others fought for justice, they then created laws to implement what they themselves believed. We must, you must, I'm getting too old for it, you must, you must pay attention. And you must talk. You must ask questions. You must assume that there is a need for us to hear each other. Return to some of your Our early leaders had to learn that they had to be open to people of color, and different cultural groups. Sometimes you may want to read the League of Women Voters and the Issues of Diversity. Kind of let us remember from whence we've come and the danger we're in right now. Our belief, our sense of justice, and our sense of being the best we can be and passing that on to our children is under great stress right now. So I beg you to remember the struggle and the rationale for hanging in and trying to be the best we can do, we can be, and pass that on to the children. The children need help right now. They need to hear your adult voice. And they need to feel the sense that justice is possible and equality is a part of what we're struggling for. So if you have questions of me, and I don't know about time, um, I welcome them. And I thank you for inviting me and to listen and share with me your thoughts. Where do we go from here? And remember, it's a very challenging period in our history. People don't want to talk. They don't want to listen. They don't want to pay attention anymore, if we ever did. <laughs> but I think we're less patient with historical facts. We're less patient with hearing each other. We're less patient in really listening carefully and not speaking from preconceived notions and ideas. 
on behalf of the League of Women Voters and all that the League still has to do. I think we can do it. Our forebearers taught us how to walk and talk and shout and fight for what we know is right. So I thank you for listening and inviting me. And I know I haven't touched on things that many of you may want to talk to me about. Feel free to. And this lady will tell us how long we can talk. And then I promise you I won't go over your time. So thank you. Minutes for questions, <laughs> <laughs> just so we can solve all the world's problems in about three minutes. Yeah. <laughs> Go. Yes. Seriously. Were on a, um, a university um, regents, weren't you? I was a, a regent. Yes. Yeah. So first African American on the board of regents. That's right. How was your? <laughs> but bring you as old as I. There are a lot of firsts. <laughs> yeah, I was a member of the national board and I, on the board of regents at the University of Minnesota. And the first black on the national board of the League of Women Voters. So I'm old and I've been around a long time. Had an opportunity. I can't complain about opportunity to have been engaged. But I tell you, right now, it's very hard because we've worked so hard for so, for justice and equality. And you know, as well as I, better than I, the need to be aware, active, conscious, alert is more critical than I think many of us, even at my age. It just takes me too far back, makes me very sad, to the point that sometimes, my friends, I have said, I can't continue. And then young people say, where do you get hope? Why are you saying the struggle? So then that boost you again to say, as long as you're breathing and walking, you owe it. You owe it to our children. That's our future. So I'm sure I did answer that as well as you probably wanted me to, those are my thoughts right now. 30 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> You're asking a legislator, that's a tough one. Um, you know, I think I'd love to hear your perspective. You know, um, you, as you know, uh, the, the League is now 100 years old, and it was just slightly before that that women initially won the right to vote. Um, I know that was a, a long journey of struggle and triumph, and for some of our sisters of color in particular, it was an even longer journey in order to get that. And I'm curious, um, with all of that struggle and triumph, where you feel we still have more work to be done? Well, that's such a good question, because we do have lots to do. And what I, what I think I understand is the rationale for enslaving my ancestors, bringing people from the richest part of Africa, West Africa, to the US of A, and the slave masters treating my ancestors the way they were treated. That people had to try and justify 
what they did to us. So laws then became the guiding force. So they passed laws that we could not be educated, could not marry, could not gather more than four or five at a time, that we were not people to enjoy the privileges of freedom, even though we had just been freed from the art of slavery. And that became policy and laws. It's in the system. People respond almost instinctively from what the system has taught them. And that is the belief that African American people and other people of color, but their focus was on us, slaves, freed, no one fully understands the value that black people placed, our freed ancestors placed on education. The first thing they did was to build schools. The Klan would come along, tear them down. They'd get up, the men in our civilization, build them again. We worked so hard at trying to have legislation that provided all of our children, all of us, freedom. But that early training, my friends, of slave masters justifying the treatment of my ancestors, then the laws, policies, practices became a part of the system. And it's etched. I read so often children today, how they treat my children. Teenagers who talk bad about black people. We, we just, just read, read, didn't we? What went on in right, right here. Kids blacking their face and making state. This is now 2020, not 19, 2020. And our people are still struggling and still believing that it can be done. It's up to you, our majority community to remember that. It's up to you and to your children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, for you to model. My parents never sat talking to us, giving us history. They lived it. They modeled it. My brother next to me was the first black person elected to the city council in Houston. My baby brother, lawyer, involved in nonprofit housing, building communities. My father, first black person to have a license for insurance and real estate. So we come from a family of working hard teaching, modeling behavior. That's where black people come from. And I'm counting on you to carry that forward. Thank you so much for coming this evening and thank you, Dr. Johnson. See, I, you I, know. Right <laughs> I know. I know. Right it's hard. Right. I just want to sit here and listen to you all day. I really do. Uh, <laughs> I just want to remind you that there are flyers for her book and you can check it out at Hennepin County Libraries and I think get on the waiting list. Um, I wanted to acknowledge Kristen Bonner from uh, 34B who was 
our, our lovely questioner who stepped in, and thank you for joining us this evening as well, our women in power, or women who are leading our communities. So thank you all, drive safely. I know it's a little slippery out there, but thank you so much for coming this evening.